right. Well, why don't we get started? And uh, I am Dave Atkins, and it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Pat Arian. And uh, in preparing for this task, I was reviewing her CV and came to the realization that it's a little bit like visiting Ikea. <laughs> you should pack a lunch. <laughs> So to not take up too much time, uh, I'll provide a few highlights. Uh, Dr. Arian is a professor of psychiatry at UCSF. She is the director of an NIMH-funded T32 on clinical services research. In addition, she's a director of an NIMH-funded center on technology and behavioral interventions, and her particular specialty is developing behavioral interventions for a variety of populations. She's on the APA Guidelines Advisory Group, the Institute of Medicine Committee on Psychosocial Standards and also on NIMH Council. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Pat. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dave, for that really nice introduction. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, future directions for behavioral interventions research. And um, I could talk for a long time about the direction that this field could go into. Uh, in fact, when I originally, my original title was, um, you know, in the, uh, from NIMH RDOC to the Affordable Care Act, and I realized that I would be up here for three hours and you would all be asleep, and so I decided to just narrow it on some of the low-hanging fruit. And the issues, I think, of the day are really around how do we do behavioral interventions research and address the um, NIMH priorities around the uh, NIMH RDOC. Um, and so, just to, to give you, you know, I'm actually here uh, applying for a position uh, to head up a, um, a team to do behavioral innovations and behavioral interventions. And so, what I'm going to be doing today is um, give you a little bit of background as to who I am, so you know um, what you'll be buying if I came out here. Um, examples from my work of how I've used RDOC to inform um, treatment development, and then moving forward, how I would envision uh, you know, a center or a team um, focused on doing this kind of research. So just by way of introduction, I am a clinical psychologist, and I've been involved in clinical trials for over 20 years. In fact, this is the very first um, paper I ever published of a trial that I led uh, comparing two different types of psychotherapies for late life depression. It was published in the Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology in 1993. It was also my dissertation, which will give you an idea of what kind of person I am, <laughs> somewhat sadistic or masochistic. Um, my interest has really focused, though, on um, how to make interventions more accessible and targeted to the needs of uh, underserved communities, so older adults, low-income um, populations, and um, people, uh, you know, uh, ethnic minority populations. And because of the work on uh, that I've been doing, or had been doing on tailoring these interventions, I had the fortune of being involved in a, in a couple of uh, large-scale national trials to uh, look at the design, uh, or uh, basically um, to evaluating the um, efficacy or effectiveness of uh, uh, integrated care models for increasing access to high quality um, um, care for older adults. And the benefit of um, these studies is that when you you know, when you do a really good job of training care managers, supporting them in doing behavioral and um, other kinds of support uh, interventions in primary care medicine, you actually get very good outcomes for underserved populations. And so uh, we were able to find uh, in one trial, the IMPACT trial, that, uh, you know, ethnic minorities, not only did they have better access, but they had better outcomes than they would have in usual care. And the same for people who are also in different income strata. And um, however, you know, even though we were able to increase care and, and, and people did get better than, uh, more improved than they would in usual care, uh, the effect sizes for the interventions that we're testing never were quite as good as what we saw in the efficacy trials. And in some cases, when there is no support for the care manager, um, they, they basically are increasing access to nothing, right? You don't get an improvement. 
So this has led the field to really think about, kind of take a step back and it's like, okay, we're doing a really good job of trying to figure out how to get people into mental health services. Um, but what's happening is that our mental health services and our interventions really aren't addressing everybody's needs. And this is why NIMH has embarked on this project called the, um, the RDOC. And the re it basically stands for the Research Domain Criteria Project. And the idea is that there is considerable variability um, you know, within diagnostic categories and there's some homogeneity across diagnoses. And this is why our treatments are only so good. They're great for some patients, right? So if you have, uh, you know, somebody with major depression, um, you know, they may respond very well to an antidepressant or a psychotherapy, but you may have somebody else with the same diagnosis who can't respond to either of those treatments. And um, the problem is, is that we have been using a diagnostic, you know, classification sy system that's largely based on symptoms that we see in self-report. We don't really have a very good understanding of what's driving the presentation, the, the illnesses that we see. And so once we kind of know the cause, um, you know, what's driving the symptom, you know, the symptoms that we see, then we're in a better position to develop targeted treatments. Uh, and so, and there are a lot of different causes, um, you know, they can be internal, they can be biological, and, and, and my way of thinking, and Bruce Cuthbert, who heads up this project, also agrees that it could be environmental, too. Um, you can have a very normal, you know, kind of good brain, but if you're under considerable stress or you're stressed over and over again, your brain is not going to work as well and, you know, you're going to lose what's called cognitive reserve and you'll have too much what's called cognitive load. And so obviously somebody who has a healthy brain but is in a stressful environment, you know, you can do some really quick interventions to kind of change the environment and you might see that syndrome go away. Versus somebody who maybe has had a family history of mental illness, um, has had their own long time mental illness, they may need a very different kind of treatment. Uh, one thing that I wanted to really um, point out is that uh, people who are behavioral interventionists are actually, this is a good thing for us. Um, our interventions are actually much more accessible to RDOC than what's already, what is um, currently uh, available uh, in terms of psychopharmacology. We have very good interventions. It's just a matter of figuring out when should we use which, you know, strategy. So the potential um, problems or issues that RDOC could um, solve one is customization, so um, figuring out, you know, what treatment we should be offering to what kind of patient. Another one is how we streamline our behavioral interventions so that they're more accessible to the patient population, as well as how we can streamline our interventions so that they're more accessible to the workforce that we have right now, and I'll talk about all three of these. So let me talk about customization first. I'm going to talk about a study that I did a while ago um, that actually predates RDOC but fits very nicely under the RDOC framework. Uh, so for many years we've known that older adults with uh, major depression who have a particular kind of presentation, uh, called, uh, basically uh, executive dysfunction, have a very poor and unstable response to SSRI antidepressants. They also have a very distinct clinical presentation. These are people who have an awful lot of apathy, not so much anhedonia. Um, if you get somebody stimulated in, you know, somebody like this uh, engaged in an activity, they actually enjoy the activity. They just have a hard time initiating. Um, they're also the kind of patients who have a difficult time solving problems, making decisions, and they're very easily distracted. So it's very hard for them to engage in goal-focused behavior. Uh, another um, feature to this uh, particular presentation of late life depression is that you can um, identify these patients very quickly by using a simple cognitive test called the Stroop. Uh, and they tend to have a poorer performance on the Stroop than um, older adults with depression who don't have executive dysfunction. Uh, so one of the leading, uh, basically the person who uncovered this um, presentation is George Alexopoulos at Cornell University. He's a geriatric psychiatrist. And, um, and these data have been replicated in other centers. But he was really the first one to kind of uncover this presentation. And so when he had found that, you know, people with executive dysfunction didn't respond
very well to particularly isotalopram, uh, he started to think, well, you know, if I were going to treat these people, what is available in the environment? Should we, you know, what's available pharmacologically? Uh, looked in the field, didn't really find any good candidates. And so he said, well, man, let's see what's out there behaviorally. And he has a team of neuropsychologists who work with him, so he's already kind of thinking about behavior. And he came across my research on problem solving therapy and contacted me and said, you know, I, I've seen this, you know, you've got some really nice results with older adults um, using problem solving therapy. Uh, could you tell me more about the intervention? Uh, you know, do you think it would treat this kind of, uh, be effective for this kind of patient? We decided to do a pilot study together, uh, which eventually led to this collaborative R01, uh, where we identified over 200 older adults with um, late life depression and executive dysfunction, and we randomized them to 12 weeks of problem solving therapy and supportive therapy, and followed them for nine months. I'm not going to go through all of the data because um, those have all been published in um, other journals, but I want it felt it's really important for me to show you this one this um, bit of data where um, I have the, actually there we go. So this is this is the depression outcomes, the disability outcomes look very similar. And this is um, this is basically depression over the course of treatment. And oops, sorry. And as you can see, um, as you know, over the first six weeks of treatment, the, the two interventions look very similar in terms of outcomes. But then when we get to about six weeks of treatment, um, that's when we start to see this separation uh, in favor of problem-solving therapy. And George asked me when he saw this, he's like, this is pretty interesting. He goes, can you explain to me why it didn't happen sooner or later? What, what is it about six weeks that seems to be the sweet spot here? And, and I'd shown him some data from like impact and other studies where we also saw like, you know, around four to six weeks is when you see improvement in mood with PST. And I said, I think what's happening is that it's basically, you know, like cognitive conditioning. Uh, you know, the way problem solving therapy works is that a, a therapist teaches you the problem solving strategy for, and, you know, you identify problems that the patient wants to, feels as important as driving their depression. They practice with you in session, and then over the week, in between sessions, they're supposed to be using the problem solving strategies on a couple of different problems. So they're kind of practicing these skills over and over again. Um, by about six weeks, if they're going to get it, that's when they get it. And, um, and the patients no longer really need the, the problem-solving uh, uh, form. They don't need to be prompted anymore. It becomes a natural part of their behavior. So this led me to start to think about, like, this would be a really interesting study that our doc was t picking up at this point, um, to look at whether or not problem-solving therapy actually does result in cognitive remediation in the brain. So now I'm going to move to localizing treatment for better access for patients and talk about the next study, which is called GOLD, which stands for Gold, Games for Overcoming Late Life Depression. i give you a little history on this. So as I was thinking about this study for problem-solving therapy, um, I talked to Faith Gunning, who's a neuropsychologist at Cornell, and um, worked a lot with George on uncovering this presentation of late life depression. And I said, so if I wanted to study you know, PSD's impact on the brain, what would I do? What would I be looking for? And she said, well, this is the neural network. It's called the cognitive control network. It's basically the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, um, you know, connections between that and the interior cingulate. And what the brain is doing is trying to distract or focus, engage in goal-directed behavior by minimizing distracting information. And what happens with depression is that um, depressed people get distracted by all the negative information. It, it inhibits their ability to come up with, um, you know, good uh, behavioral plans for reaching any kind of goal. That's why you see this um, uh, apathy in this patient population. They can't get started because they're so distracted. Uh, and she said, to do that study, though, you would need to do an fMRI study. And uh, so I went to my uh, to neurology at UCSF and um, met up with my colleague, Adam Ghazali, who does all our fMRI work, in, um, at least in, you know, in human you know, neuroscience. And so I explained him what I wanted to do, and he helped me map out what the project would look like. And near the end of our conversation, he said, you know what's really interesting about this is that I study the exact same neural network, but I do that for um, building cognitive reserve in older adults. And he's like, it's that whole phenomena that as we age, when we walk into a room, we go, why was I, why did I walk in here? Or, 
you know, I left my keys somewhere. And he's like, it's all about distraction. You know, when you get older, you don't multitask very well. And as soon as you're like walking to the room to get that piece of paper you needed and, and somebody distracts you, when you're older, it just sort of, your working memory isn't very good. So it just kind of flies out of your brain. And then he said, um, I, I actually, he goes, I'm like you. I'm an interventionist. And I have this cognitive training game I developed. Um, called at the time it was called Neuro Racer. It's evolved since, um, and he's like, and I'm finding really positive effects on the aging brain um, for this game. And so it reminded me of a project I did a long time ago with a postdoctoral fellow um, who she's at um, University of South Florida now, but uh, she was very interested in depression and older adults with me mild memory impairment. And so we managed to, at this, at, around that time, Posit Science had come, had started talking to me about the fact that when they do their cognitive training, a lot of their older adults say they feel so much better and sharper and more energized. And so they were interested in the effect of their game on mood. And so we thought, oh, well, this would be kind of cool if we can build cognitive reserve in um, older adults with memory impairments. Would they engage in psychotherapy better? And what's interesting about this story is that what happened is, um, uh, uh, we randomized people to problem solving therapy alone and problem solving therapy plus the game. And when the, the group that got the game basically dropped out of treatment like by four weeks, basically saying, I want to keep the game, but I don't want to come seeing you anymore because I feel just fine. And I had interpreted that at the time as like, oh, that's too bad. This is a nice feasibility study, but you never be able to keep people in the other arm. And then when I talked to Adam, I was like, oh, I made a mistake. <laughs> you know, what I should have done is studied the effect of the game on mood. So this led me to um, this study where we're currently recruiting. Um, we want to recruit six. It's actually 40 patients um, with executive dysfunction and 20 without, so we can have that con nice comparison. We're going to add another arm eventually um, where, where they get a dumb game. But um, uh, <laughs> essentially, they're randomized to problem-solving therapy. And, and the, the new version of, of NeuroRacer is called Evolution, or EVO. And um, what's nice is that we're getting, we're getting all the usual outcome data that we collect, but we're also doing fMRI um, at baseline four weeks and eight weeks, or in the scanner for about an hour. And what's been nice is that we've only had a couple of people who not, didn't qualify for fMRI because they've had pacemaker, um, and a few people who didn't want to do it because of claustrophobia. But once we get them in the scanner once, they do all three. Uh, so that's a nice feasibility data. And so, let me show you what evolution looks like. Um, and uh, I, these are just screenshots. I do have a video, um, but I didn't want to risk like putting the video on here and not running. Uh, so it starts off, the game starts off with this little diagnostic. Um, the game is actually a combination of a task called Go No Go, uh, where you know, you're supposed to hit the screen when you see a green ball. Um, but if you see a green square, you can't. You have to inhibit that. Um, or if you see a red ball, you have to inhibit. And it's based, there's some reaction time in there. So the more you know, that you play and the bit more accurate you are, the harder, you know, the faster the balls come. And so it kind of gets a sense of like how good are you at in inhibition. Uh, and then the, um, there's also, so this is what it looks like. He kind of has a little alien that comes up when you hit the iPad. It's on an iPad, by the way. Uh, there's also a driving task, and then we do the two combined to get what's called um, a multitasking index. All right, the game, which is beautiful, is uh, designed by people from Lucas Arts. Uh, you know, they, um, I mean, this screen, it really is a very pretty game. It's very immersible. Um, and uh, what happens is that the game is threshold that you're, uh, you know, at your performance level. Uh, it's, a, it's tweaked down a little bit so you have some success. But as you play the game and you improve, it gets increasingly harder. Um, and what's neat is that you get to go to different worlds. You earn coins and stars. You can dress up your alien. Uh, you can buy new stuff for the spaceship. Uh, and um, the company that's, that's you know, promoting this, Achille, they, uh, you can't buy this anywhere. Um, they don't want to sell it until they know that it actually works. They're very into neurotherapeutics. And they're, try they're testing it out in a bunch of different populations, like 80 kids with ADHD, um, I think anxiety disorders as well. And then I'm their geriatric depression person. Although I'm funded by NIMH, they didn't fund me. I don't, so <laughs> that disclosure right away, I get no money from Achille. Um, what happens is that the therapist basically, oh, I should say that um, 
what happens is that the patient is supposed to, we give them the iPads, we explain to them how the game works, um, and because they're older adults, um, we only have a couple icons on the iPad so they don't get too confused. It's not a busy iPad. And, um, and it's locked so they can't download stuff, um, which I've heard can happen sometimes, and uh, from the internet, which is inappropriate. Um, and then um, they, you know, they, uh, they're told to play for 20 minutes about, you know, at least five days a week, and so it's about uh, four months, and so it's about 10 hours of training, which is the industry standard, but admittedly anybody in the industry would tell you we don't know what the dose effects are, you know, that just happens to be, you know, kind of what a lot of people do. The therapist gets um, reports uh, before they see the patient um, from the game, um, so it's ported to to our therapist, and then they get to see like how adherent the patient was, um, whether or not they're progressing through the world, how many stars are they're um, getting. There's an, another bit of data they get in terms of like how their performance is going over time. So the therapist is very prepared when they come in um, to meet the patient. They basically sit down and say, uh, you know, let's see how you did during the week. I noticed you. Did didn't play on this day, you want to talk about what happened, are you having any side effects, it's a most level game, so some people can get um, nausea. Uh, it's very, very rare, but it does happen, it happened to me when I played it, um, but I bought a C-band, it's this little <laughs> acupressure thing, and it actually worked. Placebo effect. <laughs> uh, and then the next, there's we have to control for because the other group is getting you know 45 minutes of PST. We have to control for time and exposure to the therapist. So they get about 20 minutes of chatting. How's it going? Sometimes it's like you know, did you see Dancing with the Stars and that kind of thing. So I'm going to throw up. This is the data from Cope D originally with the 220 patients, um, and uh, you know you'll see the blue line is PST. Uh, we've only we only have final data on like nine participants so far, but um, it's very promising because these are the people just in gameplay, and by week four, they're at the same point that PST patients were in COPD at week 12. It does level off at, um, you know, by at week eight, but that's week four is when they stop playing. So it begs this question about dose, you know, and whether or not we should be pushing them to play for another eight weeks where we get more of an impact. Uh, so I'm very excited about this data. My plan is to submit an R01 based on the pilot. Um, I've got nice feasibility data, but these outcome data are good, are good too. Uh, if I have time, which I don't think I'm going to have time if we want questions, um, I have more data on like uh, near what's called near and far transfer. So how, how does the uh, gameplay affect um, cognitive performance? Uh, and if I have time, I'll, get, I'll show you those slides. So um, the next study I'm going to be talking about is basically about targeting treatment for clinical access. So how do we use RDoc to help refine our interventions so that it's easy to train the workforce in treating depression, okay, for instance. So this comes about from the challenges I've had in problem-solving training um, tr uh, treatment training clinicians in this intervention. And um, a couple of examples, I, um, I do some work for the AIMS Center, um, working with community clinicians, um, training them in problem solving therapy uh, for integrated care. And it's incredibly variable. I originally used to do just a workshop and then have people send me audio tapes. Um, but if I did it that way, it would take me 10 months to certify somebody and that's just way too long. And, and some of it, there's a big range. There are people that took two years um, and, you know, didn't like that. So started moving to simulated case training, so basically doing role plays and making sure that people have the skills before they started seeing at patients with PST. And I was able to cut the amount of time down, but it was still 20 hours and it's expensive, and I wasn't always able to certify people. And in fact, we've been in situations where we're still training people two years later because the agency is so invested in the clinician, and we're just like, okay, you know, if you want to pay us to do that, we'll do it. But, um, you know, and then what happens is that once they certify, and this is from a, a, a another R01 I had with Cornell, where we were working with community clinicians to provide problem-solving therapy and case management to older adults living who were um, um, poor and also disabled. So we were using like uh, social workers from Meals on Wheels programs and senior services. And what we found is that even when we got them certified, the number of corrective feedback sessions we had to get was incredible. It was like half the sessions we listened to, we had to go back and do some kind of correction. 
Uh, so it, it was, you know, daunting to me because to me, PSD is a very easy intervention. I was really shocked that it was so hard to learn, um, as was my uh, colleague George, who, this is an unhappy George Alexopoulos, who's like, you really need to simplify PST. You know, nobody can do it. You're the only person who can. It's like, that's not quite true. But, um, and, uh, you know, and I agreed with him. I said, yeah, I need to really rethink this therapy. And I don't, I'm kind of stuck as to what to do because it's such a, it's, it's such a specific therapy that um, I really didn't know how to revamp it. So I was at UCSD um, at a meeting and I ran into Jurgen Unitzer and I said, um, I told him, I'm like, I'm really struggling with this. I'm really frustrated that I can't get clinicians to learn PST. And I know this is true for CBT and a lot of other interventions. And he said, you know what I've always thought would be really fun to do or interesting to do is, you know, you have a patient come in and you just give them a simple behavioral challenge. Do something different this week than you've been doing, right? And then see what happens when they come back. If they come back and they did it and they benefited from it, great, continue with that strategy, okay, do something else that's different. But if they come back and they didn't do well, or you know they weren't able to do it, or they didn't benefit from it, then figure out what's going on and kind of strategize around that. Um, I had also been reading Bruce Torpedo's work from the child world, where he was struggling with the fact that um, in Los Angeles and Hawaii, um, you know, ch children's mental health services were trying to train clinicians in several different kinds of therapies. You know, it's like, you know, um, you know, uh, trauma-focused CBT or this intervention for that problem, and the, it was really overwhelming the therapists because, and they were pointing out that you know, there's there's so much overlap between these therapies. I don't know. I get confused. I don't know why I can't just do. Blah. And so he's gotten into this thing where he's, he's very interested in common elements of therapy with the idea being that you train people in the common elements first and then you can specialize them because they, they sort of get it. Um, I thought, so it, you know, having these conversations, I started to think, well, this is really interesting. And maybe that's what I need to do is go back and think about, you know, the common elements of therapy for late life depression. And so again, I, I worked with um, Faith, and then Pat Rowley is a psychologist at uh, Cornell who does a lot of work with peers and um, you know health workers. Uh, and we sat and you know kind of talked about like, okay, so what is sort of a common theme that we see when we're working with older adults? What do they want to work on first? And so we determined it was behavioral activation. They like you know usually the first thing that um, older people do when they come in is like, I just need to get out and do something pleasant. It's also health related issues too. Too, but we figured we could give people sort of a choice between focusing on something they wanted to change about their health behavior or focusing on something um, engaging. But it would be along the lines of what Jurgen had recommended, where you just kind of start with one and see you know, how they do. We also sat and strategized to think about, like in our experience, when we work with older people around behavioral activation type of um, interventions, what are the common barriers? And so negativity bias is one, um, you know, and what I mean by negativity bias is that they pay, they don't, it's either they pay too much attention to all of the bad, you know, negative information, or they don't pay enough attention to the positive information, the goal-directed behavior uh, uh, information. Um, you know, another uh, common barrier is affect regulation, so they get too anxious to try something, or, you know, too sad, or I just felt horrible today, or I felt really sick. That I couldn't get out and do something. Uh, and then the other common um, uh, uh, barrier is we had a lot of experience with, which is distraction and you know um, cognitive control. But rather than reinvent CBT, because you see where we're going here, right? Um, we wanted to pick very simple strategies along the lines of what neuroscientists would use. And so, for um, people who have negativity bias, we give them these uh, really simple <laughs> negativity bias exercises. So they're actually called strengthening your positivity bias. And I wish I could think of a better name for that because it makes it sound like you know. Think of the glass half full, you know, and that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about what we explain to the patient is that, you know, we see that you're sort of, you know, no matter what, you're always kind of looking out for the uh, second shoe to drop, right? You know, you're always looking for uh, what what's going to happen that, that could put you in danger or put you at risk. And a lot of the patients who have this bias will say, that is me exactly. That is, you're describing exactly who I am. So what we need to do is um, strengthen your 
your ability to recognize uh, other cues in the environment that let you know that it's safe to proceed. And so here are some exercises that you can do. And so they're, they're very simple. They're things like reading the newspaper and then writing down all the positive stories that you see in the paper. Um, for um, affect regulation is pretty straightforward. Faith talked a lot about resting state and, uh, you know, that if you can improve people's, um, you know, how your brain is when it's kind of on idle. Uh, and people with anxiety and affect issues, their idle is higher than our idle. Like, we're like, if you're not, don't have a mood disorder, when your brain's in the resting state, it's very calm. Um, but if you have an anxiety or depressive disorder, it's actually always kind of agitating. And so um, we figured that the simplest thing we could do is come up with strategies that are you know, sort of mindful, but the patient could pick whatever they want. So we give them a lot of examples, like, you know, some people find prayer helpful in, in helping them with their rest, you know, bringing their brain to a resting state. Other people, you know, just want to focus on, like, something pretty or, like, read a passage. So whatever they want to do that's simple for them to do, they can, they can pick. And these are strategies they would practice over the week, just like with cognitive training. And then with the um, disorganized, um, you know, distracted patients, it would be like, uh, you know, a, a, what we call a flat Evo, um, just a, a, a distraction game, you know, that's similar to like multitasking, but isn't the immersible game. Okay. And so we're funded now to do this um, uh, non-inferiority trial. The idea is to see whether or not Engage is as least as good as PST, so no worse. Right, uh, and we had we were following people on disability and functional outcomes. We're also starting co um, to collect cognitive outcomes. I'll talk about that in a second. But the main thing is we're looking at um, the the main primary outcomes are time to training. So do we see a difference in how many hours it takes to train somebody and engage versus PST, and then the number of corrective sessions they need over time. And so our pilot data, um, and this is on um, 30 therapists, uh, you know, the, we do see that Engage is actually a little slightly bit better than PST, um, but, you know, pretty close. Uh, and then the skill drift over time, um, we see far less skill drift with Engage than we do with um, PST. All right, so those are some examples of how um, RDOC can help you think <laughs> through behavioral interventions um, research. So now what I want to do is uh, talk a little bit about the strategy for this. Now, one thing I was hoping that you all could pick up on in this, um, in my uh, presentation, is how much I depend on other people to do this work. This is very much a team approach. And it's, for people who do health services research, this isn't foreign to us. We always work in teams. Uh, but I think that, you know, people more in the clinic world this is going to take a, a little bit of like you know okay I don't I, I, I don't have to learn neuroscience so much that I do all the neuroscience but I need to learn it enough to work with neuroscientists to help inform our interventions um, so you see I've worked with you know neuro, uh, neuropsychologists uh, other psychologists who work with uh, healthcare workers um, but I've also worked with engineers and computer scientists as well to help develop the games uh, and the assessment tools uh, we also need to kind of let go of, um, I think traditionally, and, and this is my opinion obviously, is that sometimes we get really wedded to our interventions. It can sometimes feel like a, almost like a religion. You know, I'm a CBT therapist, you know. And um, I think we have to kind of step back and say, admit that our interventions are good, but they could be better. And so we don't have to kind of stick to what we've always known. Um, one of the things that uh, I'm hearing as a council member is that um, a program is very interested in high-risk, high-yield research, and that is actually okay to quote-unquote fail. So if you're testing a mechanism that you want to study, uh, you think that your intervention is um, targeting cognitive control, which is the mechanism I study, um, and you don't find any change there, that's okay. Because we're learning a lot about what's happening, and it's you know it could either be the measure that you're using or the type of cognitive control that you're investigating. Um, but the more that we do experiments and kind of can cross things off the list, the closer we get to identifying the mechanism. Now the trick is to convince journal editors that it's okay to fail too. <laughs> Maybe that'll come in the next ten years. Um, one thing, too, that I, I think is very important is that we need um, research models that will help us iterate very quickly, too. Because, uh, you know, there's, um, 
it's it's really been a frustration of mine that you know we have these interventions and they sit on the shelf, right? And nobody uses them. And it's 30 years later that somebody decides, oh, this is a great intervention. Uh, an example of what I mean by um, you know quickly iterated models is one that's that's going on right now. Uh, there is a I don't know how familiar you are with the RAISE project, but it is a um, multi-component intervention for first break psychosis. It includes family, medication, uh, uh, rehabilitation skills, um, and kind of like um, uh, fast hospitalization, kind of getting kids back into the community. And it's a really nice program because the intent is to really make sure that the first break they have is not so traumatic that you know they also experience PTSD on top of it. Because it's a very horrible experience for a kid to, and the family to have um, you know a psychotic break. And um, what hap what so what's happened is that the study, the actual RCT has been done, and they found, and the investigators, Lisa Dixon, I think, is the PI on the project, found that uh, you know it's a very effective intervention. You know, you get much better uh, rehabilitative outcomes on the kids. They stay in school. They 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 can work. They aren't in, um, you know in the hospital as much. They're not nearly as depressed. They're more adherent to their medications. Uh, and so what uh, Bob Heinsen, who is the director of services uh, branch at NIMH decided to do is to go over to SAMHSA and tell them you need to do a demonstration project on this intervention ASAP big national one and that's what they're doing right now they're planning the you know I mean Lisa isn't have even hasn't even published her data yet I don't think uh, and you know the I you know so so the plan is basically you know as soon as we know something works let's deploy it out into the community and see how it really works right so that's what I mean by like fast iteration. And this is a great place for this because you have so many networks where you can try to do that. So as I think about um, a team or a center or whatever it is, I don't know what to call it, um, for innovations in behavioral interventions research, the vision I have is really to create like a cutting edge, high risk, high yield, um, research program that is focused on the development and deployment of novel behavioral interventions and that we're agile enough that we can address the needs of the day and we can really get things out there that are working as soon as possible. Um, it, the, the interventions I feel need to be targeted and efficient but be ready to be scaled up right away right as soon as we see the proof of concept. And it also needs to be a transdisciplinary team, okay, um, with the best people from across all the fields um, to help design smart and targeted and user-friendly interventions. Uh, and so just a few examples of things that I'm think playing in my head with. Um, so one is, um, and this comes from my, my relationship with um, Adam Ghazali, um, you know, and I'll show you some pictures, pretty pictures here. Uh, uh, one thing that I'm really interested in is integrated intervention methods. And so uh, this, is, um, this is Adam's Neuroscape Lab, and it basically uh, Steve Hauser, who's the, the chair of neurology at UCSF, you know, Adam went to him and he said, I want to create this, um, you know, uh, neurology lab, like behavioral lab, that uh, utilizes te tools and technologies that anybody can get access to. And uh, Steve said, well, we, we have the scanner bay that we haven't put a scanner in yet. You can have it and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, and so what's really interesting about this um, neuroscape lab is that all, except for the EEG cap, um, all of the equipment in here is something you can buy at Best Buy. Uh, flat screen TV, connects. <laughs> so Deb and I were talking about that earlier. Polar heart rate monitor. And what he wants to test, basically based on these um, psychophys studies showing that um, if you increase aerobic activity uh, and do cognitive training close in time, either together or shortly after, that the uh, cognitive training gains are, uh, gains are actually better under aerobic activity than if you're sedentary. And so this is, um, he's wearing a mobile EEG cap as well, so um, he's got some engineers who are taking the heart rate um, measures and the, um, the EEG measures, and they're, they're programmed into this game that's basically a cognitive training game. And um, I have to, well, 
I'm by this eye microphone, but basically um, the game is set up that you have to hit balls. It's like this game called Adventure Time, I think it's called, or Adventureland um, from Kinex. And there's a lot of squatting and jumping and all of that to get your heart rate up. I played it once and I was gassed. I was like, I can't do this. Um, uh, so this is an example of, you know, when you're thinking about mood disorders or anxiety disorders, exercise is a really effective intervention. Cognitive training is a potentially good intervention. And this is sort this is fairly accessible because you're using technologies that a lot of people have in their home. Not everybody. Uh, Adam's got an interest from the Department of Education. Now he needs data behind this before they'll do anything uh, because of the tendency for public schools to uh, exercise, um, you know, PE. And uh, they said if you sell this as an educational tool, then we can factor in exercise and cognitive training to enhance, um, you know, learning outcomes. So there, I think there's a lot of interest in this kind of, you know, fringe research. <laughs> um, Okay, and then the next thing um, I'm interested in is closed-loop adaptive training and therapies. And so um, one example of that is um, a, pro a project that uh, uh, Yvette Lemon and uh, Amy Bauer and I are planning, which is using wearable devices and uh, mobile uh, you know, mood assessment to feed back to clinicians about how patients are doing in real time. There are some companies who are already using behavioral measures to uh, and have been able to use um, like machine learning technologies to uh, identify uh, red flags that somebody might be relapsing in their mood disorder. And so the idea would be to, uh, you know, use use kind of like mobile technologies like a Fitbit or whatever anybody has uh, to play into um, feedback to the clinician. Um, uh, the next is, you know, um, I would want the center to continue doing the work like along the lines of what we did with Engage, you know, coming up with steps, kind of, um, you know, algorithm-based therapies that would be easy for clinicians to use, um, as well as uh, thinking of interventions that are going to be useful in the real world and target communities that actually don't always have access to technology, so we still need to think about behavioral expressions of these interventions. Uh, so... The tools that would need to be developed, um, one of the issues about doing RDoC-oriented research is that um, when you test the uh, mechanism, it can take a very long time. Usually, like if I wanted to do a cognitive control assessment for a patient, it would take 45 minutes. And that's on top of the hour I already am with them doing the skid and all the mood assessments. Uh, my colleague, Joaquin Anguera, um, has been developing an adaptive cognitive evaluation tool. It's on, a, it's on, it can be on different platforms, computer, iPad. It does have to be in at least an iPad um, because you can't do kind of a testing on a phone. It's a little bit too, too small a screen. Uh, but what's really nice about this tool um, is that he's been able to take a 45-minute assessment using psycho information from psychophysics and narrow it down to 10 minutes. Is high. Most of the tasks are reliable. Some of them he's still tweaking, and we might need to use some other mathematical, you know, signal detection tools to to get them to work better. But for the most part, we can do these cognitive assessments in 10 minutes anywhere. So I think that that's a very important, um, you know, we also, a lot of companies have these great, you know, mobile, you know, uh, fitness devices. This is Samsung's SIM band, and it, I don't think you can buy it yet. I think they're still working on the technology, but um, they have a, Samsung has a strong interest in having the researchers um, validate their algorithms to make sure that they actually are like medical devices. And I think getting some more kind of information about how useful these kind of tools are in informing, you know, decision making or even feeding back to the patient about what their well-being is like would be, um, it would be interesting to have really valuable tools like that. Um, Let's see. Uh, you know, also, I'm interested, uh, Adam does a lot of this work where there are these things called mobile EEG caps, and this is one that kind of feeds into iPhones. Uh, and if you wanted to, like, collect data on cognitive performance, um, there, the, this, this, like, this uh, cap is about $150. It's relatively cheap compared to, like, what you would need in the lab. You don't need um, to use gel at all. You can just put it on your head. And um, he's tweaking the algorithms right now, but he says he's getting it pretty close to being useful in the lab, as useful as what they use in the lab. Um, another um, tool uh, 
I think is important is developing a network of, um, or using a network of, of clinicians that we could, you know, say, can you give this to your patient and try it out and see how it works and kind of feed it back to us. I, this is my problem solving therapy network. These are all the trainers throughout the United States. Um, it's kind of interesting how it's all around the coast. There's nobody in the middle, but anyway, it's <laughs> not political, I promise. Um, <laughs> do you have somebody in Alaska? Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I've been able to actually use them for some of my mobile research. So I do some research on mobile apps and how useful they are for mood uh, improvement. And um, they've been great about, like, you know, yeah, I can just give, you know, they're all in private practice. And they're like, yeah, I'll just give it to my patients. And, you know, we pay them to, for the feedback and that kind of thing. So having that network, I think, would help us really quickly on our development and then um, I you know another tool that I've developed through an R34 um, is uh, basically this uh, research portal that we created that does uh, allows you to do randomized clinical trials completely remotely so we have this um, I have data on this later too but we have um, since July 30th we have recruited and I haven't talked to any of my team this week, so maybe more. But we've re we've been able to screen 1,200 people, um, and we have about half of that randomized into the clinical trial. Uh, we are, and they're very in the. Um, dropout rate for this study, there's a difference between using the app and being in the study, but the dropout rate for this study is about 20%, so it's not unusual for a typical randomized clinical trial, but it's way better than what we see in the internet-based studies. Okay, so I think this kind of tool would be really helpful for us to have because we could do a lot of different kinds of studies using this remote technology. So. Um, Okay, and then the organization, um, I mean, this is aspirational and it'll probably change you know, over time. I don't know if you can see it, the colors are sort of pink. Um, but, uh, you know, I really feel like we need a lot of different kinds of, you know, groups sort of thinking in different buckets uh, in order for us to be innovative. So the advisory group would be a combination of interventionists and people in the community who could help us really think through what's what are the big problems? What are we struggling with? This is sort of like a PCORI oriented kind of way of thinking. But if we can figure out, and we're already getting this through our Brighton study, um, you know, the where um, you know, uh, participants have been telling us you're not asking some of the right questions. You know, these are you should really ask me about X, Y, and Z. And so having that kind of feedback is really helpful in terms of coming up with innovation. This is the most expensive group, but it's the intervention design and proofs of concept group. So if we do anything in technology, we're going to need mathematicians and engineers to help us, you know, design the algorithms that underlie our tools. Um, but we, I really feel like whether it's a it's on a tablet or it's a person talking to another person, um, you know, working with uh, people who are experts at user design, um, you know, should uh, is going to be critical because sometimes we think our therapies are accessible, but they really aren't. And so to the degree that people can help us think through how to how do we make this an accessible intervention, it would be really helpful. And people who are trained to do that, not you know, we picked it up on the way, is is important. Um, of course, interventionists, you know, smart, and there's a lot of interventionists here at UW, you know, who, who do this kind of research would be part of the proof of concept team, as well as neuroscientists if we want to do our dark oriented work, and then this network of providers who could help us, you know, um, um, test our, our interventions. You know, and we can't do any of the work without getting the money to do the, the large trials. So, you know, again, partnering with neuroscientists or whoever we think is important to be involved in the project, um, interventionists, and then data experts uh, to help us do the large scale trials. And once we find that these interventions are effective, um, we need to scale them up into the community, either through our training programs um, or, you know, um, our, our um, implementation programs. Okay. So um, that's really quickly just my vision for what I would see in the future. Um, you know, I, and again, the ideas I have around a center are fairly aspirational, um, and I hope we get to move there at some point. Um, so at this point, I'm, I'm happy to take questions from, from you guys, and I leave you with some inspiring thoughts around innovation. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, are there any questions in the audience <laughs> here? <laughs> yeah. This is great. I, I'm, just, I'm not sure I understand how R34 
that fits into it? Like, what? How do the recent domain criteria fit into what you're saying? Like, what am I supposed to get about research domain criteria? Okay. Yeah. So that's my fault for not. And so the I question is, how does how does RDoC fit into what um, I'm proposing here? So it depends on what part of the grid you look at on RDoC. If you're looking at the genetics and the biomarkers, probably not that much. Um, but if you're looking at the neural circuits and behavior side of the grid, it fits perfectly. So, you know, and the aspect of depression that I study is cognitive control. That is a domain in RDoC. And the, um, the, the way we measure it is looking at um, particularly uh, distracted attention is the thing that we're most interested in in my group. But, you know, if you were working in anxiety disorders, you would look under the fear, um, you know, domain. And then in there, it would also be a lot of attention, um, but also some affect regulation, too. So um, it's just a matter of, I should have put the grid up there. Um, you know, we have a habit of like looking at the grid, part of the grid that's most interesting to us, but it's, it really covers a huge spectrum of science. And um, the neuro circuits, the behavioral piece is what really applies to the behavioral interventions. Although maybe one day we'll find a genetic marker for, you know, whether or not therapy would be better than a drug, but I think that is like way down the road. But it's a good question. So the question is, how widely validated has problem-solving therapy been for non-geriatric populations? Yeah, so um, it is an effective intervention. It's been found to be effective in adults. There's some nice meta-analysis showing that um, it's not just for geriatric patients. It's effective for adults. Um, some schizophrenia um, behavioral interventions include problem-solving as a component of the multifaceted treatments uh, because of the executive dysfunction that people with psychosis have. Uh, and also there's some emerging literature showing that it's effective for attention deficit disorder kids. I was wondering how we might incorporate or simplify formative Okay, and the, so the question was like how would we simplify it for inpatient services? I, I think that would be Great. I, I don't. I haven't worked in inpatient, so I don't know the setting well enough to. I mean, I did it in graduate school, but <laughs> that was 30 years ago. So, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, in, in learning more about what inpatient is like now, as opposed to you know when I was a grad student, because I'm sure it's changed a lot. Uh, you know, I would want to get a sense of what the environment was like, how long a stay people have on inpatient, how stable they are when they leave, and then think about how I could tweak problem solving therapy for the for the setting. Um, are there questions from the satellite groups? Any in here? I have ten minutes. You want to see the other slide? Oh okay. <laughs> So the question is, um, how much is executive dysfunction and late life depression actually a sign that some of these people are um, becoming demented? And uh, you know, George and um, Yvette Jeline, at, uh, she used to be at University. Of, uh, I'm sorry, at Washington University. I think she's at. Pittsburgh now. I don't know where she is. Uh, and then also, um, I'm blocking on her name, the, the neuros neuropsychologist at, uh, in Chuck Reynolds' lab at uh, UPMC has done a lot of work on this. And some people, yes, some of them are going to convert. And we actually had that. We did a five-year follow-up. And, and um, between people dying and relocating and then ending up in nursing homes, we didn't have much of a sample left. But um, uh, yeah, some of these people did end up with dementia, but most of them not. And some of these patients actually said they'd always been like this, a little, little disorganized, um, and wondered if they had ADHD. That was a really common question. Do you think I have ADHD? I have a grandkid with ADHD. And in this cohort, they didn't screen for ADHD back then, so it's possible that that you know they had some you know already pre-existing neurological you know tendency in that direction. That's a good question too. Um, 
You want to see the other slides? Okay, I got to figure out how to get back into. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, so, yeah. Um, just, uh, okay. So here's your here's your smorgasbord. I can show you data on um, the the um, adaptive assessment. I can show you more data on the game study. I can show you data on the Brighton and also um, the Brighton Research Portal. Okay. You want to see the game data? Okay. <laughs> well, you have to go through this. So this is this is Ace. Hold on a second. Um, well, can I show you this? Because this, I'm very proud of this. <laughs> um, so this is the um, app study, the Brighton study. And I, when I made this slide, we had only um, you know, screened in um, 1,000 subjects, but it's, it's more. And um, you know, in order to participate, you have to have a smartphone or tablet. And it didn't matter which platform, because we use Unity, um, which is a gaming platform. And um, they are randomized to either problem, a problem-solving app, um, the cognitive training game, or just this, this app called Ginger IO that, that sends you um, health tips over time. And um, we did have an RDoC mechanism in here. We said we picked these two interventions to test cognitive control. Um, because both PST and um, evolution, we thought, targeted that. Um, and we didn't know what behavioral activation would do. So it was, it was actually technically our control. And so the main aims were who downloads these apps. And also, it's a methodological study. So how do we recruit people in? Um, how long do, do people play? Um, you know, how, how, and do they stick to the study design? Uh, and then do they work? And uh, this is one of these examples where we had a budgetary error that worked in my favor. We were supposed to only recruit 150 people, but we can recruit 1,000. So that's what we're going to do. <laughs> and this is one of these things. This is an R34. And a lot of money did go to development. We had a lot of donation from companies too in terms of time, um, but uh, you know it's a very low uh, staffed kind of study. We have um, one person who basically watches the you know uh, the flow, and um, just to show you, this is what the I hope I can play this. Um, do you know how I would get that? Just click it. Oh, it was. This one. There you go. One second. I knew this was with the issue with movies, right? Yeah, it's not playing. Yeah. Okay. That's because I switch platforms. <laughs> anyway, I was going to show what the portal looked like because we do um, we do a video description of the study. We do um, video and written informed consent. Uh, you know, all of the screening is done online. Uh, you have to pass a quiz on the consent uh, to progress, so that takes care of some some of the gaming issues that can happen. Um, not all of them, uh, but um, so uh, this is sort of what the recruitment looks like. You know, so we get some people who start and never finish. You know, they kind of get halfway through the assessment and then they dump. Um, and then we have, you know, about 9% kind of disqualify, but then the rest make it through the study. Um, we are we haven't tried out Google AdWords yet or um, Facebook, but we've tried a lot of different kinds of advertisement. And so far, the, big, the biggest bang for our buck um, is that we put uh, uh, ads in the job section of Craigslist throughout the United States. And so we get a lot of people participating that way. Um, one of the criticisms we, we originally had is that we wouldn't get an ethnically diverse sample. And we actually do get a pretty diverse sample. Um, we have a diversity supplement on this grant. And we're going to do this in Spanish. So we'll be able to up, up the, the diversity of the study even more. Um, and then um, this is just some data my person ran for me about health services use among the minorities versus not. And about 24%, we asked people, are you in therapy? Are you in treatment? And about 24% of the ethnic minorities seek mental health services as compared to 37 of the non-Hispanic whites. Um, but they're um, almost twice as likely to use, um, but whites are more likely to use mental health services. So we just did a really quick um, odds ratio on that. 
And then this is, okay, this is the data from Gold. Um, and what I'm doing here is comparing it to the NeuroRacer study. And so this was published in Nature. And there were two tasks that we were measuring, um, distraction and, um, uh, you know, a uh, sustained attention task called the TOVA. And the aid is one that Adam Gazzali, you know, has studied for many, many years. Um, it was, I think it was his dissertation for his neuroscience PhD. But um, this task, the top task measures was called nerve transfer. So it's basically a measure of, um, you know, uh, working memory, um, uh, you know, attention, you know, distracted attention that is not the same kind of working memory task that is being done in the game, right? So you first want to test is there near transfer. So do you actually see impacts on other aspects of working memory? And then you want to test far transfer. And far transfer is the holy grail here, uh, which is that, it, that the cognitive improvement, uh, you know, um, is seen in tasks that are similar but different from what you're training on. And Joaquin gave me a really good example. It's like if you spent a year playing tennis and you practice and you practice and practice to the point you were really good and then you played racquetball and were really good at racquetball, that's near transfer. If you start playing volleyball, um, and you were really good, that's far transfer. And the reason is because your legs are ripped, is what he said. <laughs> you know, so, um, anyway, so this is the data from Nature on, um, on near transfer. And what was really, this was a very exciting paper because you got really positive effects for training on near transfer. Um, and you also got it, and we're also finding it um, in our gold study, that the, we're getting really good um, you know, near transfer in our nine papers. So you have to be kind of patient with that. Um, then this is the FAR transfer data. And this is what everybody was excited about in the Nature paper is because very few people find FAR transfer, and, and, and Adam did. Uh, and then let's see if I can get it up. And then we're also finding FAR transfer, too. Um, but the error bars are really huge because it's fine subjects. So <laughs> hopefully we still see transfer. But uh, but that, those are those are some of the cognitive data that we're seeing in, in the study. So I'm very excited about that project. Um, okay. So uh, is there any other questions? <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank you for your time. <laughs>